Oops, we haven't got to fight the good fight, have we? Good morning. I think Karen is going to come and speak to us. Karen, are you here? <laughs> Sorry about that. I took my eye off the timer. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a church this morning. It's nice to see you all. I'm Karen, if you don't know me. Um, there's a couple of notices this morning. First one, it's church weekend away next Sunday, next weekend. So there's no church service here on Sunday. Okay. But on the Saturday, Coffee Tree is open and we would love to encourage you to come and um, meet with some people at Coffee Tree and have a bit of fellowship together. Um, and I think that's all the notices this morning, apart from one big notice that I have, please. It's a plea, actually. So if you are going to the church weekend and you have time on Thursday or Friday morning and you have space in your car, 
that you could come and pick some stuff up and take it for us. We've got lots of stuff that we need to get there. So if you could speak to me before then so that I can kind of coordinate things a little bit, that would be really, really appreciated. So if you've got space in your car and you can come here to pick stuff up, that would be great. So please let me know about that. Um, and Steve is going to be leading us this morning, so shall I pray before we get started? Father, we do thank you so much that we can gather together as your people to um, worship you, to hear from you, to be together. We pray that as we spend time with you this morning that we would hear what you have to say to us, that you would stir our hearts and minds. Father, do us good this morning in your name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. So, good morning, yes. Um, it was Duke Street Junction earlier. Some of you have been to church already. It's nice to have you in church again, which means we've, it's a quick turnaround, so we haven't really practiced. But it's going to be great. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we celebrated Easter two weeks ago, but as Easter people, we celebrate Easter every Sunday, don't we? So let's enjoy singing, low in the grave he lay, up from the grave he arose. Thank you. Lectio 365, if you do that Bible reading. Holy Spirit, revive us today. Surprise us with your power and your presence as we gather. Heal the sick. Speak words of faith and comfort. Bind up the broken hearts. Grant us repentance. Pour out your gifts of grace. And renew in us all-consuming passion for Jesus. 
We're delighted to have Sam Miller with from Open Doors with us today. He's already done one service, so again, he's got to work hard. Uh, many of us know Open Doors and it, that it supports the persecuted church, and many of us attended the recent prayer meeting where we prayed for the persecuted church. But Sam can give us a personal insight into the work of Open Doors. So I'm going to ask him a few questions to inform our future prayer. So Sam, would you like to join me? Is that working now? Yeah, yeah good. So, Sam, it is great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, first of all, can you share any breaking news with us, such as places where things for Christians are currently getting worse? Yeah. Um, one of the challenges is, is that often we can talk about places um, that we can talk about places, but where the challenges are most extreme, we can't even talk about those nations because we exist to serve the local church in those countries and sometimes the local church will say please be praying for us but please don't tell people about the situation because in the world of social media that information gets back with things like AI um, and digital persecution and can lead to circumstances being much more difficult. So I can't actually tell you some of the most extreme places um, but one of the uh, just two countries you could be praying for at the moment is um, Nigeria. Um, it's a place where more Christians each year are killed than all the rest of the world put together. Um, but also at the moment there's a huge range of abductions taking place in Nigeria. So last year about 5,000 Christians were abducted and held for ransom. And it would be like David, your esteemed leader, uh, being abducted whilst walking his dog in Sutton Park. And then a message coming through to the elders of the church saying, if you want David back, um, you need to find 100,000 and to pay for David back, which I'm assuming you'd pay at least 100,000 to, to get David back. <laughs> but um, but th what the challenge is that that has is that then the, the local church then is having to face the, uh, raises huge um, amounts of money. If you imagine as a church being asked to find 100,000 uh, by next week or, or David you know, goes to glory early, then you know, where you've got savings that are saved up or maybe you're planning for a holiday or, or whatever, and you as a church, you know, bring that money together to, to rescue and redeem David. What that does is it impoverishes the local church because they are paying money to um, militants who are opposing the church. But what it also does is gives those militants more money to buy more extreme weapons, AK-47s. So it's just a really difficult situation where it is getting worse for Christians, but also, you know, terrorist groups, um, Islamic terrorist groups particularly, are kind of gr being more armed um, to commit more atrocities. So. One of the things we're doing is advocating with the British government to advocate with the Nigerian government um, to be more um, on top of um, stopping the illegal arms trade, as well as dealing with those who are perpetrators of that. Um, India is another country to be praying for. Um, you may well know that um, India elections are taking place really over the next six weeks um, all across the country. Uh, with 1.5 billion people voting, you've got a staff of 15 million people uh, to run that election, which is you know, an operational nightmare. <laughs> um, but one of the challenges in India is that increasing numbers of states in India are adopting these anti-conversion laws, which is that if you convert to Christianity from um, Hinduism, then, well, you're not allowed to do that, and those who share the gospel um, will be persecuted for that. And... You know, I've heard many, many stories firsthand from people of um, their, their suffering because they have converted to Christ, that they're economically disadvantaged, they're educationally disadvantaged, that they can be thrown out of their families. Um, so that's a massive challenge. And some of that anti-conversion laws has come about through Modi's government and through Hindu nationalism specifically. So with Modi looking at a third term, which would be hugely unlikely that he wouldn't get that third term, I think we just need to really be praying for the church in India, praying that where the, what the enemy means for evil, that the Lord would somehow intervene and turn for his good. Thank you, that's uh, it's very useful. Um, I wonder, is there a current project or situation that you are particularly excited about? I think one of the really exciting things is how many people are coming to faith through um, access and through digital channels. Um, information about um, Jesus and the gospel and that's fraught with tension because actually where people are digitally digitally accessing um, discipleship they're also at risk of being exposed in some of the countries they're from 
but we're getting many, many stories from across the Middle East particularly, and Christians being in countries where it's illegal to be a Christian, where people are accessing Jesus. Um, uh, a story from Yemen, a, a friend of mine who's from Yemen. Um, if you come along to an event in um, November, which I think we've got a video about in a moment, you'll hear some more of his story directly. Um, but he is actively working to disciple people um, in Yemen, which is a country that's closed to the gospel. There's a lot of kind of military conflict and tribal conflict there at the moment. Um, but he said a few weeks ago he had the privilege of baptizing somebody over Zoom in Yemen in their own bathtub. So he was in the UK and where he is uh, in kind of a refugee status. Um, with this guy with his video phone in a bathtub in Yemen, putting himself under the water and coming back up, as my friend Rina from the UK says, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's amazing how, you know, digital can be used as a tool of persecution and restriction, but also can be used as a tool of, of communication. Um, so I think just praying um, for just more advancement, and that would be great. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of the Israel-Gaza conflict. Is, how, would, how would you say that is affecting Christians? I mean, Christians in um, you know, Israel, Gaza, Palestine, really from day one have suffered persecution from a whole range of different sides. And uh, there are Christian communities that we are actively supporting um, in Palestinian territories at the moment. Um, I think one of the things to be praying for is that wherever the people of God are present, they are seeking to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So uh, those who are in the Palestinian territories, what they are seeking to do is to be loving, generous, kind, compassionate to those who are suffering all around them. And how we can play a part in that as a church is that as we stand with those who are Christians who are in those situations, then they can be the hands and feet. So I think the thing to be praying for is that actually in the midst of all the suffering, the turmoil, the, the, the pain and the chaos, and there's so many different political kind of points around that, I don't want to go into any of that at all, but you have got Christians on the ground who are seeking to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I, it's just interesting to be praying for, um, actually that hearts and communities might be opened up in the midst of this, that people may um, access the grace of God, the kindness of God, the compassion of God. So I think the... The coming years, however that situation plays out, um, are, is a time to really step up as the global church to support the local church um, engaged in works of ministry. Great, thank you very much. We've got some things to pray for, haven't we, guys? So can we spend a few minutes in prayer? Uh, I would suggest if we pray quietly with the person next to us or the, the people around us, because uh, then we get lots of praying done and uh, we, can all, we can all take part. If you want to pray on your own, obviously that's fine. No, no pressure to do anything, but uh, spend a few minutes in praying for the persecuted church. Thank you.
we could draw our prize to a close and thank you. Okay, I'm sure I asked the question, how can my brothers and sisters cope with persecution? And I'm sure they would respond, yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's another quote from St. Paul's letters to the Corinthians. So let's proclaim our faith with the song, What Gift of Grace is Jesus my Redeemer? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving the music group enough warning. Let's pray. Lord, bless them in their speaking, please, and give us hearts to hear.
our ears to hear and hearts to respond. Amen. Thanks. The reading is 1 Daniel, verses 8 to 21. And in the Church Bible, it's page 884. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel... I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the time set, end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Great, fantastic. Um, well, keep your Bibles open at, at Daniel, because we're going to refer back to that. It's very, very important um, that we are basing our knowledge of God not on what people are telling us, though we hope people are telling us right things, but on just having Scripture um, available to us at all time. Um, with Daniel, it's helpful to have a bit of a, a backdrop, a bit of context of understanding of what is going on um, prior to Daniel to really make sense of, of the story. So we read at the, the beginning of Daniel 1, there's a bit of context setting. It's the third year of Jeho- Jehoiakim's reign. It's about 605 um, BC, 605 years before Christ. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the Babylonians. He's besieged Jerusalem. He's taken possession of the treasuries um, of the temple which Hezekiah foolishly um, had showed to the Babylonian envoys more than 100 years earlier. So that's another whole story in 2 Kings 20. Um, And we're told that the Lord handed King Jehoiakim over, um, along with the temple treasures, and some of the young men of nobility, and beauty and wisdom were also taken back to Babylon. And Daniel was one of those. So that's kind of the, the backstory. But we need to understand a bit more of the context to make sense of, of this moment. And why would the Lord hand over Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar? That feels like a harsh thing. So if we go back to the book of Jeremiah, and I think there's a slide up. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, with a, a, a warning that Jeremiah gives to the people of Jerusalem. Jeremiah declares, from the 13th year of Josiah until this very day, 23 years. And just a bit of back context, Josiah, it it says of Josiah, he was the king, that there was nobody like him before or after whose heart was steadfast in the Lord. 
So the the people of Judah and Israel had, had come out of, of this context of kind of leadership of different kings that were either faithful to God or kind of unfaithful to God. But Josiah was one of those who was faithful to God like nobody before him. So he'd been kind of ruling and reigning. But Jeremiah had been speaking and challenging the people of God, even under Josiah's leadership, to challenge them about how they lived faithful to God. The word of the Lord has come to me, he said, and I have spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. Time and time again. It's this sense of this repetitive kind of challenge and story that Jeremiah said he has brought them from the Lord. The Lord sent all of his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. So the situation with which the Lord sends Nebuchadnezzar is not just kind of in a vacuum of the Lord is fickle. You know, the people of God have been challenged time and time and time again by both Jeremiah and other prophets to change their ways, to change their lifestyle, to change their behavior, to change their hearts, to, to reestablish a life and a relationship of faithfulness and obedience to God. So Jeremiah and the other prophets have been declaring God's words to his people but they've been ignoring effectively what they've been warned of and they've continued to rebel against God. The terms of relationship versus rebellion are really clearly you know, constituted in the establishment of the kingdom of Israel and of Judah. And they were established by Moses and you can read in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy 28 some of the backstory of the context of what does it mean to be in relationship with God as opposed to be in rebellion of God. I just want to read a little bit from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is, I just find it just really, really clear and really, really, really simple. And this, this, the, the basis of the covenant is that God would honor his people, but they had to remain within the terms of what it is to honor God. I'm at the moment, I'm listening to uh, a podcast about the rise of the, the Russian Empire, which is absolutely fascinating. But what you realize in the midst of this, that there were so many um, czars who came to power, male and female, that were completely unfaithful to their covenant of marriage. I mean, they literally had, you know, misters and mistresses, you know, in every cupboard. Um, and it seemed to be okay. And with Catherine the Great and uh, her kind of late husband, they had each had a younger mistress and a younger kind of mister that, you know, that they kind of pulled on. I just think the unfaithfulness of that kind of setting. And yet for me in my marriage covenant with my wife, you know, we made vows nearly 25 years ago. Thank you very much. Um, that we would, you know, have eyes only for one another, that we'd honor one another, we'd love one another, we'd cherish one another, we'd be faithful to one another. And that the terms of the marriage covenant is effectively the terms of the covenant that God makes with his people, that he will be faithful to them, but simply they need to be also faithful to him. That doesn't seem that bizarre a thing, does it? Like to have that depth of commitment. But in Deuteronomy 30, in verse 11, um, God says, this command I give you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. I love that. Just God is saying, it's not too difficult. I'm not asking that much. It's not beyond your reach. It is not in the heavens so that you have to ask who will go up to heaven and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. And it's not across the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea, get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. But the message is very near to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you may follow it. See today, I've set before you life and prosperity, and I've set before you death and adversity. I don't know if any of you are fans of Eddie Izzard. I'm not a particularly big fan of Eddie Izzard, but he does this kind of incredible sketch called Cake or Death, and it's a bit of a kind of um, take on the Spanish Inquisition and also <laughs> the Church of England. It's quite entertaining. But there's, there's a Lego version of it, and basically... Uh, the people are presented, right, you have two options. You have cake or death. Cake or death. And it's just this kind of funny sketch of why would you choose death when cake is an option, but it's a slightly false scenario. But you've kind of got this situation here. The Lord is saying, choose life and prosperity or choose death and adversity. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a fairly obvious choice here. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, statutes, and ordinances, so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. It's just so rich. God's desire is to honor them. God's desire is that they'd be in a faithful covenant with each other. 
and that they would enjoy prosperity. But if your hearts turn away, verse 17, and you do not listen, and you are led astray to bow in worship to other gods and to serve them, I tell you today that you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. So that, that's something of the kind of the back context of, of the covenant, really, that God is speaking through Jeremiah to the people of Judah to kind of remind them, this is the covenant that you're in. This is the, the background. But in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah prophesies, because you have not obeyed my words, next, next one, because you have not obeyed my words, this whole land will become a desolate ruin. And those nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. So this challenge of saying to them, guys, rend your hearts, change your behavior, realign yourself. And even at this moment, this warning is an invitation to the people of Judah, to the Jerusalemites, to repent. But they continue to walk in rebellion. They continue to walk in indifference. Ezekiel prophesied and said that they, they make no distinguishing between the common and the holy, between the sacred and the non-sacred. It's almost like they've totally just created the world within their own image, their own view, rather than being obedient to God. And that rebellion is expressed through idolatry, through immorality, and through injustice, through self-sufficiency, through selfishness, and self-absorption. They're living for themselves. They've totally forgot that there is a God in heaven that exists and calls them to live by a certain standard, and they're living entirely by their own rules for their own self-absorption. So judgment begins in the year 605 BC, which we read about in, in Daniel 1. And it begins with the first deportation of the next generation of nobility and royalty, including Daniel, those who are beautiful and those who are wise, as well as some of the articles of the, of the temple. King Jehoiakim is left in place um, as a vassal for Nebuchadnezzar, so he doesn't have real power. Nebuchadnezzar has the power, but he's left in place just to kind of run the show operationally. But Jehoiakim, in the midst of that, he then rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, seeks to make a new partnership uh, with Egypt in opposition to Nebuchadnezzar. And that leads to further siege and humiliation of Jerusalem in 597 BC. Bit of a history lesson here. Um, in the lead up to this second humiliation, Jehoiakim dies and his son Jehoiachin takes the throne and he becomes king. And he and his entourage are then deported to Babylon in 597 BC. Jehoiachin's uncle then is placed in power as a kind of a vassal king and his name is changed uh, to Zedekiah. And the, the renaming of people was a way of kind of um, almost assimilating them into your leadership. So Daniel was kind of uh, renamed as Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were given new names. And it's a sense of saying that your new identity in this new land is, is, is this. And, uh, and that's what happened also with Zedekiah. But 2 Kings tells us that he continued to walk in rebellion against God. And in 2 Kings 24 20 it says this, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that God finally banished them from his presence. I mean God had had enough. He'd given them really clear kind of articulation of this is what it is to, to choose life, to walk in prosperity, to walk in blessing. You know don't choose these things which lead to death, walk in these things. Then the people of God were not walking out, and so he sends his prophets who time and time and time again challenge the people, say, guys, address your behavior. You cannot live as you are living now and expect to have the presence of God amongst you. You have to make choices to choose life and not choose death. And even when these very, very contemporary messages are given, I mean, Jeremiah prophesies to Judah literally a couple of months before Nebuchadnezzar you know, surrounds him. And he says, I will send the armies of the north to, to take you captive if you do not rend your hearts and change your ways. And yet still they're indifferent to the challenge to change the way that they're living. And so this kind of prophecy that they'll be banished from his presence, this is played out historically with King, King Nebuchadnezzar's army besieging the city for two years. And then ultimately, in 586, there's the burning of the city and the burning of the temple. The tearing down of the walls of the city, which you later read, you know, Nehemiah, 70 years later, begins to kind of rebuild those. And in the midst of this whole kind of geopolitical scenario, Ezekiel is also prophesying, and he's declaring to the people of God, that the presence of God, the inhabiting and consecrating presence of God that exists in the temple, 
that that presence of God is departing. The temple is the heart and the soul of their identity. The temple is the dwelling place on earth of the presence of God. So the presence leaving the temple is synonymous with the essence and identity of who they are being lost. Yet though Ezekiel prophesies, the people are largely ignorant of what is going on and indifferent to this message. In Ezekiel 8.6, I think we've got this on here as well. Ezekiel records the Lord speaking to him and lamenting, Son of man, he says to Ezekiel, do you see what they are doing here? More detestable acts that the house of Israel is committing so that I must depart from my sanctuary. I find Ezekiel's revelations profoundly moving. They reflect the lament of God in departing from dwelling in the midst of his people. He does not want to separate himself from his chosen people. He wants to abide with them. He wants to remain with them and invites them to abide and remain in him. But there's this lament, I cannot remain present while my people are behaving like this, that they are behaving with idolatry and immorality and such injustice. Because by my presence being there, whilst they're doing these things, is almost to endorse all of those behaviours. I cannot coexist in that setting. And chapters 10 and 11 describe the gradual removal of God's presence. And they capture the reluctance of that departure. The glory of God lifts off the tabernacle, goes to the threshold of the temple, then moves to the outskirts of the temple, and then moves to the mountain to the east. You know, this, this gradual, this almost God saying, look, can you not see I'm, I'm drawing away? Can you not see? In order that their hearts would be provoked to say, God, we can't go anywhere without you. Please do not leave. He, almost the provocation is God is, can you see that I'm departing so that your hearts say, God, how can we do this life without you? But they remain indifferent. They remain just ignorant of, of that moment. In the midst of this removal, before the final departure, God speaks of a new day, a restoration of his dwelling with man, when he removes our heart of stone and rebellion and places within us a new spirit, a heart that is tender to him in chapter eleven nineteen. And so even in this kind of God having to distance himself from his people, the heart of God is desperate to want to dwell with his people and says that there will be a new day that comes where I will soften your hearts. I will place my spirit within him. And the significance of this moment should not be lost on us. This is the end of an era, an era that began on Mount Sinai nearly a thousand years earlier when the spirit of God dwelt amongst men in the tabernacle, the tent and in the temple. This temple dwelling is being vacated by God. It's marking the end of a millennia of presence. And what is shocking is how ignorant and indifferent the people of God are to this reality. And though the temple is rebuilt in the future under Nehemiah and Zerubbabel's watch, the Ark of the Covenant is never returned and the presence of God is never recovered. Indiana Jones is still looking for the Ark of the Covenant. All the best to him. And it's more than 500 years before the presence of God returns to the temple. When Jesus walks through the door and he announces, one greater than the temple is here. But that's for another day. But that's when the Spirit of God re-enters the temple. So I hope that gives a bit of a kind of sense of backdrop of the book of Daniel and for the story of Daniel. Because Daniel marks a pivotal moment in the history of the people of God from being a people defined by the inhabiting presence of God to being a people defined by exile. Exile geopolitically, but also exile spiritually. And in this chaotic moment, Daniel and his friends are seeking to find their identity whilst in exile in a foreign land with foreign gods, with foreign practices, and with foreign cultural norms. And Judah and Israel for years have struggled to not compromise with foreign gods, with foreign beliefs and foreign practices whilst possessing their own land. And now Daniel and his friends, they're displaced from home. They're in a context where they're expected to assimilate with their environment, to just adopt and absorb the cultural practices around them. But we read earlier in Daniel 1 that though they are now living in exile, they're seeking to not assimilate their identity with their new culture and yet new environment. They're seeking to live faithfully free from all of the contaminants of their environment and faithfully and consistently walk in the ways of Jesus. To live faithfully as citizens of another kingdom, a kingdom of which Jehovah is king. 
They're seeking to live by a diet that serves their identity rather than their environment. And Daniel identifies the importance of behavior in expressing belief, activity in expressing identity. He's very practical in identifying what it looks like to be faithful rather than to compromise. And Daniel's stance of faithfulness, we read, brings favor both with God and with man. When we read about Jesus, we read of how he enjoyed favor with both God and man. And the point is that if we align ourselves in relationship with God, he will also favor our relationship with those around us. And this doesn't mean everyone, as we know from Jesus' life, that he had enemies, but we also know that he had influence. In Daniel's story, we read about how he had enemies, but he also had influence. But he kept himself anchored in God and kept trusting in God. In Daniel, we read how trust was tested very, very quickly. And the substance of his trust is revealed in his first encounter with Nebuchadnezzar. When he finds himself brought before Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man who exists at that time, in order to interpret his dream, he's tested as to what is the root of his trust. Is his trust in himself or is his trust in God? Because Nebuchadnezzar offers Daniel the accolade of being a dream interpreter. That's what he says, I hear that you are a dream interpreter. But Daniel doesn't take those accolades that are offered to him. He doesn't in that moment seek to then promote himself and say, yes, I am a dream interpreter. He doesn't seek to find his identity through the things that he can own and possess. But what does he say? Let's just read in Daniel 2, 27. It says, no wise man, medium, magician or diviner is able to make known to the king the mystery he asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I love that. Right at the start, he's just saying, hey, don't look at me. I'm not the main guy here. But he, he's pointing to God in heaven. He's pointing to the sovereignty of God. And Dan, Daniel's stance of faithfulness, firstly to his identity in God rather than his environment, it invites the presence and the power of God to protect him and to provide for him. This doesn't remove him from risk but it equips him for risk. He's learning to trust God so that he's ready to be tested by God. He's defining his diet in order to support his direction of travel. I uh, foolishly signed up to do a triathlon uh, this year. I'm doing a triathlon in, uh, in July. Um, David has seen me training in Sutton Park. Um, and uh, I do a little bit of running anyway. Um, I do a little bit of cycling. Swimming, I don't do. <laughs> I really don't like swimming. Any people love swimming here? So there we go. And uh, so I've got to swim one and a half kilometers at the start of this triathlon um, before then doing 40k cycle and then finishing off with a 10k run. And uh, I'm beginning to realize what on earth have I done signing up for this. It's not something you can just wake up in the morning and do. So I've got to order my steps. I've got to order my kind of the diet of my diary and the diet of my time um, and also the diet of what I'm eating to be in line with the direction of travel that I'm aiming in to do this uh, triathlon. And if you're training for an event like a triathlon or a marathon, or you're preparing for an event like a, a wedding, we've got lots of friends who are doing kind of wedding prep at the moment, you know, we design everything in view of that destination. Um, you know, one of my friends is getting married and he's got a personal trainer ensuring that he has kind of a, just a very special physique uh, on the day of his, his wedding day. Um, I know many people have done that and then quite quickly it goes downhill afterwards. <laughs> but it's like it, that destination, it, it drives your diet. It, 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 it causes you to pursue certain things and to restrain yourself from other things. And, you know, this desire is tested at various points, and the strength of our determination is, is tested. I've been trying to eat a bit more kind of healthy and focusedly, but then you get invited somewhere and you've got Krispy Kreme donuts that are just calling to you and saying, it won't matter if you just have one bite, but one bite, as we know, is the, uh, it's the, it's the route down. But it, it's only by keeping the main thing, the main thing, that we're going to remain resilient. It's only by keeping our minds focused and our, our diet set that we're going to be able to take hold of what it is that God wants us to take hold of. And for Daniel, the main thing was that he trusted God. This trust was tested, but through the test, that trust was deepened. As he put his confidence in God's ability to provide, to defend, to lead, 
he saw that God did what only God could do. And that deepened his trust for a later time. We're not going to look at Daniel in the lion's den, but that's another situation where he's tested further down the line. And actually we read in Daniel, do you realize that he was in captivity for 70 years? So when we're talking about exile, it wasn't that he was in exile for a short amount of time and then went back to life as normal. Pretty much his whole earthly existence was lived in exile. So his diet wasn't just a short-term thing. It was a long-term diet relative to his environment. We see the same spirit in Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who equally de declare their trust in the sovereignty and supremacy of God, even in the face of being tested. You can read that in Daniel 3, 16 to 18. It's a trust that God has got it no matter the outcome. That's their trust. God has got it no matter the outcome. A trust, a faith that is not conditional on God answering all of our wants and needs when we want it. Like, I will trust God as long as he answers my big shopping list. We see, particularly in Shadrach, Michigan, and Bendigo, their statement, even if God does not come through in the way that we anticipate and expect him to, he is still God, and we will still serve him, and we will not serve you as emperor. Just really, it's, we so easily read these kind of stories, and they're like, oh, that's great. But there are people around the world who are inhabiting that story right now, who are in situations where they are being told to bow down literally to physical um, gold statues and to, to bow down to these idols, and they are resisting, and they are being thrown into prison for that. The story of Daniel is not an Old Testament story. It's a contemporary reality for many, many Christians around the world. And I think knowing that, it provokes us to read it differently, but it also provokes us to think, okay, how do I make sense of that? What are the things in my life that I'm being invited to bow down to instead of bow down to God? What are the things that I'm being invited to pursue and press into that actually are not choosing life but choose death? Maybe they're short-term, sugar and sweet like a Krispy Kreme donut, but actually they don't lead to that which is long-term healthy and fits in with the diet of trusting in God. And let's be honest, so often we want to have faith on our terms, conditional on physical safety, conditional on our comfort, <clears throat> conditional on our health, conditional on our financial security, conditional on a certain standard of life that we esteem to be our right and that the world tells us all the time, this is your right. Conditional on popularity or conditional on happiness. But real, complete trust is living for Jesus, no matter the cost or the circumstance. I have the privilege of encountering this regularly through the stories I hear and through the people that I meet. And behind every testimony is trust. Behind every testimony is trust. Trust in God, that God has got it no matter what. That our lives are in his hands. Yemen is number five on the World Watch List, which is a report that we produce each year, which goes to the, the British government and identifies the countries around the world where following Jesus is, is most costly, most challenging. And Salah is a Christian from Yemen. He and a friend you know, regularly share Jesus outside the mosque in Yemen, which is an incredibly gutsy thing to do. In Yemen, it's illegal to convert um, from Islam to Christianity, and it often leads to the death penalty. And if you are able to join us uh, at an event in November in Birmingham, you'll hear directly from uh, a Yemeni believer just something about what God is doing, but also the cost and the challenge. There'll be a video at the end of this that will give you some information about that. But Salah and his friend, they became known as the crazy guys. Such was their boldness in sharing their faith. Wherever Salah went, he told Yemenis about Jesus. I became known as the person who knows Jesus, says Salah. There were deep conversations and many people came to know Christ. Salah ultimately had to flee his country because of war. But Yemen is always on his heart. And it's led to him creating a house church network despite the danger to his safety and even to his life. He says... I think there's a quote in this. If we sit at home and do nothing, we would be safe. But what kind of Christians would we be if we weren't risking our life for others to know life? That's a profound statement, isn't it? If we sit at home and do nothing, we would be safe. But what kind of Christians would we be if we weren't risking our life for others to know life? Soon after, Salah started receiving death threats, but this hasn't stopped him today. Helped by Open Doors partners, Salah travels in and out of Yemen, serving 70 Christian families. 
in the country, providing support, including food, discipleship and training. And in it all, he trusts that God has got him and he continues to stand no matter what. This is the kind of trust that is forged and deepened through the fire of trials and testings and hardships, through persecution and suffering. And often when things don't turn out the way that we hoped or planned, it's a trust that says, I will still choose you. I will still choose to trust you, God, no matter what. I believe that God can deliver me, but if not, I will still trust in him. That's real trust. It's not conditional. It's absolute. And Daniel and his friends, they demonstrate to us and they invite us to consider our destination and therefore to direct our desires and our decisions towards that act, towards that end. You see Daniel with a very, very pragmatic kind of dietary formation that he says, in order to live in this context that is so opposed to God, I need to make certain choices. There's certain things I need to say no to. And there's certain things I need to say yes to. And I think the same challenge exists for my life. You know, maybe you guys are in a different world to I am. But for me, daily it's the challenge. What do I need to say yes to in order to live in intimacy with the presence of God? And what are the things equally that I need to say no to? What are the things that would divert me or distract me from what it is to know God? You know, what ways have I become a settler in society rather than a pilgrim? with eternity. And I think it's so, so challenging. Earlier on, for the, for the kids' service, we did a little illustration with a, with a helmet, and we're talking about the helmet of salvation, and, and the helmet of salvation is something which is about guarding and protecting our minds in an awareness of who God is, what God is like, what God says about us, what God has done for us, and who we are in God. And, and the challenge of Paul is protect your minds because actually the environment around you is opposed to so much of what you believe. I spoke about North Korea where actually children are indoctrinated at school against all religions. And they're told that if you at home see a Bible, a black book like this, then your family is probably in danger and at risk. You must tell your teachers because they might be able to intervene and save your family. So then some children will tell their teachers because they love their families. Then their families are taken to a prison camp, grandparents, parents, and them as the children. Such is the desire and attempt to eradicate the ideology of Christianity from the nation. And so things like... You know, wearing the helmet of salvation, renewing your mind of truth becomes so, so profound. Paul writes to the Galatians, inviting them to follow his example in walking out trust daily as the overflow of his identity. He says in Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That sense, each day I trust in the Son of God. It's almost like, today is a new day. I'm going to renew my priorities. Today is a new day. I'm going to renew my mind with my destination. Today is a new day. I'm going to renew my diet, my desires, my direction of travel. Kim sang who's a, a lady some of you might have met in November. She was from North Korea, and she came and spoke at the Standing Strong event that we did last year. And she said, in persecution, Jesus is all you have. And you discover that he is all you need. It's the same for Daniel and his friends. In the midst of being aliens and exiles in Babylon, they discovered that God is all they had, but also he was all that they needed. Peter similarly writes to the chosen living as exiles in, in 1 Peter 1. He's writing to the Christians who are scattered across um, northern Turkey. Those who have been chosen by God, but they are also exiles. They are exiles kind of geopolitically. But they are also exiles because they've been chosen. They are now citizens of heaven. And whilst on earth, it's a short time frame within the overall scheme. And, and he writes to them. He says, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's almost saying, wear your helmet of salvation. You know, be sober-minded, be clear-minded. Sobriety is opposed to kind of drunkenness. It's about the sense of being, kind of having self-control, being clear, being focused. Be sober-minded. Don't be kind of wishy-washy and, and just pulled all over the place. Be clear. Be focused in what you're doing. 
As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. In a recent conversation I had with an Indian believer, they reflected on this verse being their favorite verse. And I wasn't expecting that. I was thinking it'd be a verse around kind of resilience or, you know, God's faithfulness. But their favorite verse was, be holy, for I am holy. And uh, this person was called uh, Shahdal. They were part of a, a, a tribal community in northern India. And in, uh, 20, on the 22nd of March, 2023, so just last year, they were having a prayer meeting. And uh, as worship finished, 15 to 20 people came into the meeting to disrupt it, and they started beating Shadal. They took him to the police station. A case was registered against him in lieu of anti-conversion laws. And Open Doors partners were able to provide legal support for him, but he was in prison for one month, and then he received bail. He was of Hindu background, and also as a, with his tribal background, he was engaged in black um, magic. He knew about 300 chants, but he became weak, and his mantras weren't working. A friend took him to a church service. And you've got to think about that. We, those words, a friend took him to a church service. For that friend to tell him about Jesus was at risk to that person's life and experience in the community. But this friend loved Shadol, cared for him, and sought to offer him the chance to know life. He invited him to a church service. And when he was prayed for, instantly he received healing. He reflected that with one prayer to Jesus, he was healed, whereas 500 mantras had made no difference. And he decided that he was ready to live for Christ and to die for Christ. When he gave his life to Jesus, Jesus, he said he felt like something lifted off him and he felt light. He was a very shy person, but in faith he has become much more bold. His neighbours are antagonistic and abusive to him and his family. His children go to a Christian school as a way of protecting them. His wife also became a Christian after he did. But his, tra- his family treat, treat him as untouchables. They won't eat with him, they won't visit him, they won't allow him to visit them. That's part of the challenge for many Christians around the world, complete rejection and isolation from family and community. In the midst of that, he leads a house church with about 25 people. He lives in a tribal region, and those in the church from that region have come to Thraith through um, Shadol's testimony, and they also face persecution. So in coming to Jesus, not like come to Jesus and you suddenly become a millionaire, It's come to Jesus and actually face rejection and isolation. And when you meet people like that, you realize how good it is to know Jesus. If people are willing to suffer so much, there's so much gain in that relationship. He told a story of of a guy who was carried into one of their um, services um, by his friends on a sheet, and he'd been paralyzed from birth, and they prayed for this man for two hours. In the end of two hours, he was able to walk again, never been able to walk just incredible stories. I could tell you so many stories that, you know, from people I've met and stories I've heard. Be holy, for I am holy. This is favorite verse. It's about being set apart to God. It's about fully trusting in God. Back in the, the second century, there was a epistle that was written to Diognetus, a letter that was kind of uh, written. And in it, um, uh, the writer of the epistle says, Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind, either in locality or speech or in customs. For they dwell not somewhere in cities of their own, neither do they use some different language, nor practice extraordinary manner of life. But while they dwell in cities of Greeks and barbarians, as the lot of each is cast, and follow the native customs in dress, food, and the other arrangements of life, yet the constitution of their own citizenship, which they set forth, is marvellous, and confessedly contradicts expectation. They dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens. They endure all hardships as strangers. That was kind of written about the context of the early church. And it's that challenge to, to live only as sojourners. That our citizenship is in heaven. And Peter is writing to believers across northern Turkey to remind them of their identity, their citizenship. Daniel's story is a reminder of somebody who is conscious of his identity and his citizenship and because of that because of his trust in God and knowledge of God he lives differently and his friends live differently and bring glory to God and I think Daniel and believers around the world like Salah and Shadow they invite us to reflect on our diet and our dependency and to consider 
how do we live holy in the context that we're in? This is not just about our effort, because actually our effort will fall short. It's about us inviting the Holy Spirit daily to fill us. It's about daily dependency on him. It's about daily decisions. It's about orchestrating our diet daily. It's about setting our intention sober-mindedly to resist the invitation of our environment to compromise and instead set out our intention to walk out our identity as citizens of heaven rather than of the earth. As we do that, we influence our culture and our communities with Christ-like faithfulness. As we live free from temptation and distraction, living fully in the grace of God. And I think hearing stories like Salas and Shalos, it stirs our heart, it does mine, to also think about, well, how do I make a difference? How do I strengthen those who are actively living in exile? And every bit of support, every bit of prayer that we can offer strengthens Christians in the midst of persecution. They're really counting on us to stand with them. And I think, as I've said here many times before, that as much as the church around the world facing persecution needs us, we really, really need the church around the world living faithfully in this persecution because it reminds us of what is really at stake. It reminds us of our identity. It reminds us of the gospel. It reminds us of the value and importance of the presence of God that we have daily access to. It challenges us to not compromise for that which is short-term and short-lived rather than that which is eternal. I hope that as I've shared from Daniel today that it's both encouraged you but also don't apologise for hope that it's challenged you because certainly challenged me in kind of reading it. I think whenever you give a talk uh, you're probably most convicted in the process of doing that because uh, to speak with integrity and authenticity means that your own heart has to be exposed to God and I definitely know that the Lord has kind of pointed at various things and said Sam this area of your spiritual diet is not conducive to life in God. These are things that you need to let go of. These are some priorities that you need to pick up on. So I really encourage you to maybe go and read down your, yourself and reflect on it. Think about the backstory. Think about the loss of the presence of God that they are in that moment of. And yet, here you have Daniel and his friends, that they have a heart to be faithful to God. And if you are not connected uh, with the persecuted church, then part of our role as a ministry is creating that connection, um, sharing stories, um, sharing testimonies, raising prayer. There's a bunch of resources on the way out, including uh, some cards here, which if you want to get connected, if you fill out one of those, then we can kind of send you resources to help you to pray and be aware. And again, I think as you read those things regularly, it really, really does remind you of of what's at stake. It kind of renews your mind with, with truth in a really, really helpful way. Um, I'm just going to play just a short video, just as an invitation. We've got this event in November um, where we'll have uh, believers from the Persecuted Church come to share their story. Um, if it's free in your diary at the moment, really want to encourage you just to prioritize that. I think you'll find it really um, kind of strengthening and inspiring. And also for those who come to share from other countries, it's incredibly encouraging when they look out and see faces of brothers and sisters here in the UK who are for them and, and praying for them. So just watch this short video and then we'll pray to finish. It's amazing to be in the same room with people literally standing strong for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. It's so uplifting. People should come to Standing Strong because you don't know much until you hear these stories personally and it rings a little bit better, I'd say. When you're there in person, you relate as people. It's so easy to get like wrapped up in your day-to-day -day life and then you forget what some people are like suffering for for Jesus and you take it all for granted. Hearing the fact that they feel such a like connection to the wider church through our prayers and how important those are encouraged me to keep praying for them. Even if we're not close to them, we're from different countries, we can just pray together. It, it just unites us and that's, that's the least we can do. That's the 2nd of November. There's some of these flyers at the back. You can grab that. Again, I'd encourage you to book in for that. Um, can we just stand? And um, We've already prayed for the persecuted church, so thank you for doing that. But I'd love to just pray for us in our response to that. Let's just be quiet for a minute.
Heavenly Father, thank you that, as we've read today in your scripture, just your passion for us as your people, your longing and your desire to walk in just daily friendship with us is just unbelievably just extraordinary. And Lord, we confess that it's so easy that we lose sight of who you are. We lose sight of what you've done. We lose sight of what you invite us to. And Lord, as we chatted with the children earlier about just the helmet of salvation, we pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you come and renew our minds with just the good news about Jesus. Renew our minds with an awareness of who you are, God, and what you've done. And Lord, whatever is in the way of us thinking clearly about you, Lord, whether discouragement or disappointment or distraction, Jesus, we pray that you'd help us to see how you are present to us throughout whatever the circumstances. And I just pray for this a beautiful family of God gathered here today, and each individual part of this family. Just pray, Jesus, draw close. Draw close. But where there are things that need to be laid down in order to set hearts straight with you, pray for just the beautiful conviction of your spirit. And Jesus, just pray just for a reminder again of just your gift of salvation. Lord. May, it be, may the joy of salvation be renewed in our hearts today, I pray. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Do we trust God enough to stand for him? That's, that's the challenge, isn't it? We were going to sing Faithful One, because God is faithful, isn't he? And he is with us through the storm. We're running out of time, so we won't sing that. Is our desire to glorify God, Daniel glorified God in being obedient? Our brothers and sisters around the world who are faithful glorify God, don't they? We're just sing the song what is it in my life lord be glorified please use this as your response to the sermon let's let's say to god we want our lives to glorify you so in my life be glorified do just do stand thank you
David's going to lead us in prayer. Thank you, David. Very struck by um, the life and the consistency and the faith of Daniel. Um, and Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. So let's pray for ourselves and for those we know to have that godly wisdom to live differently. We praise you, Father, that you alone are the only wise God. And we admit that we're often foolish in our thinking and our actions regularly we believe we know better than you we second guess you or we doubt the wisdom of your ways frequently our plans come to nothing and we forget that to fear you to live in awe of you that is wisdom so help us today help us this week to trust you afresh to fear you and to shun evil amen Father, we thank you that you say in the word that if any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask you because you're a God who gives generously to all without finding fault. So we come to you confident of your generosity, aware of our own weakness. Give us wisdom, we pray, not to set our desires on things that will pass away, things which will only make us poorer in the long run. We ask for our daily bread, as you have taught us, Lord Jesus, our necessities. Lord, you know the things we need. For each of us, that might be different, but please grant us those things and help us not to go after the luxuries which can easily capture our attention and our hearts. Give us wisdom not to worry about things that matter little in the light of eternity. Thank you that you are a generous, loving, Heavenly Father, who knows what we need even before we ask you, help us to believe that this week. We ask for wisdom not to look after our bodies so carefully that we neglect our souls, not to stuff our minds with anything we read or watch and forget to chew over your words in the Bible, your life-giving word. Give us the wisdom not to forget that one day we must die and that this life is only a school and a preparation for something much larger and far more wonderful and more lasting. We can be foolish, Lord, so please grant us understanding and fear of you this week. Amen. And then, our Father, we pray for our governments. They need wisdom. They act as though they know all the answers, but of course they don't. So grant especially this morning to the governments of Israel and Palestine and Iran wisdom and a desire to work for peace. Help them, help them not to repay evil with evil, but to overcome evil with good. Please grant wisdom to leaders to know how best to intervene and to stop the situation in the Middle East escalating. Please would you help those who are seeking to bring aid those who are seeking to treat and heal the wounded, as well as those seeking to get leaders around the table to talk. Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. You said, blessed are the peacemakers. And so we pray for men and women of peace to prevail. Thank you that you're coming again and your kingdom will bring an end to all war and injustice and suffering. We long for that day. Whilst we wait for it now, Help us to live for your kingdom. Give us wisdom to see where we can intervene and make a difference in our part of our world and lead people especially to you. Amen. And finally, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, your Son, who is our wisdom. For the wisdom of his words, help us to listen to them and to obey them. For the wisdom of his life, Help us to live and love as he did. For the wisdom of his death and resurrection, 
Help us to value and treasure that old rugged cross and to glory in his great sacrifice and to love him all the more. And so may his spirit, the spirit of truth, who's taught us and challenged us from Daniel this morning, enable us to live out the wisdom we've discovered there this week to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you, David. We could finish there, but I think we'll sing another hymn, shall we? Um, it's not always being an e easy being a Christian, is it? And we are called to fight. We are called to a battle. A race that is long and often hard. So we're going to close with a song, a hymn, which I think I probably last sang at school in the days when you sang s hymns in state secondary schools. Those days are gone, long gone, I'm afraid. We used to sing it at pace and not think about it, but the words are amazing. His boundless mercy will provide. Faint not nor fear, his arms are near. He changeth not, and you are dear. Lay hold of life, choose life, and it shall be your joy and crown eternally. And the tune is called Duke Street, how about that? Fight the good fight. Let's sing. Sing it to each other. Encourage one another. Close a blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. If you would like prayer, please do come to the front and somebody would be delighted to pray with you. If not, please enjoy a cup of tea and coffee and we'll chat in the following. Thank you.